All my mom friends and I have been debating this, and we don't know. You know, we don't we don't do this for a living. Usually, you do what your pediatrician tells you. And I think this vaccine kind of had a rap that was more controversial, as we said in the intro, even before COVID. But during the whole COVID debacle and being misled so many times by the public health officials, in particular about vaccines, many of us who were not previously vaccine skeptical, like yours truly, have become a little vaccine skeptical. Like, I don't, I don't just trust my pediatrician with a knee-jerk reaction now. Um, so anyway, I really do appreciate you guys coming on and actually debating because so many people don't like that either. So and anyway, we'll, we'll kick it off. All right, let me start with you, uh, Dr. Kristen Walsh. Can, can you give us, you know, the short sell for why you like this vaccine and you think it is valuable uh, for parents to have with respect to their children? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's like every medical decision we make for kids, you're weighing the pros and the cons. And for me, you know, I have a lot of experience with this vaccine. I've been a pediatrician for a while. I've been giving it to my patients ever since it basically was recommended and and came out around 2006. And I think that the cancer burden from HPV is, is so high. You know, if you look at you know, unvaccinated adults, about half of them are carrying strains of HPV and not all of them cause cancer. Some of them cause genital warts, but it's just not, it's not a very easily avoidable virus. I think if you're going to be sexually active, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, common. It's pretty much out there. And I, in other words, you don't really have to do anything crazy to to get this virus. And, you know, you can be from a very religious family and do everything right and wait to have sex till you're married and and still get it, honestly. So I think in that scenario, uh, the disease burden is such and the vaccine safety is such, you know, from my experience, from the data, that it's a pretty straightforward decision for most kids that the benefits outweigh the risks. Hmm. Okay. And when you say half of adults are carrying HPV, this is one of the stats that I read in the packet and getting ready for this, that it could be even higher than that, that it could be like the vast majority of adults walking around out there have HPV. Now, what does that mean, Doc? What does it, what does it mean if you have HPV? What do you have? Yeah, well, I mean, viruses, we, we sort of live in this relationship with viruses all the time. You know, if you've ever had chicken pox like I did with a, as a kid, that virus is still around somewhere hiding in your nerves of all weird places. So some viruses, your body just clears and gets rid of. And actually quite often the body clears HPV um, within a couple of years, but sometimes it doesn't clear as easily. Sometimes it um, causes just sort of bad cytological changes in your cells that lead to cancer. Sometimes it causes genital warts. Um, so, you know, many of us are, are carrying HPV and we'll never have symptoms, we'll never have cancer, we'll never have genital warts, we'll never know we have it and our body will clear it and that's great. But the problem is you just don't know if you're going to get one of the benign strains or one of the bad strains. And there are the bad strains, there are multiple of them, they're common enough that you want to try to avoid them if possible. When we say the bad strains, do we mean the cancer causing strain or cancer? And I would bad? say genital warts too, because, you know, I know that's not cancer, but it's also not pleasant. And the problem is you can get those things treated, lasered off, whatever, and you're still carrying the virus. You didn't clear it just because the warts got treated. Like your body will clear it or not. But, you know, until then, you're, your partners are very susceptible. You can't really prevent transmission with a condom because a lot of times it's just close skin to skin contact. So there's this viruses that cause cancer and there's the viruses that cause genital warts and they're just different strains of the same virus. And then is there, is there some other group of strains that's like benign that causes neither one of those things? Yeah. And they all have numbers. So like the cancer causing strains are like, I think 16 and 18 are the big ones. I always forget which ones cause genital warts because the numbers don't get thrown around as much. But um, I think for oral cancer, it's always like either 16 or 18. And um, that there's nine of them that cause cancer, which is why Gardasil 9 has the name nine in the end, because that's the newest strain of that or the newest you know iteration of the HPV vaccine. It, it protects you against nine cancer causing strains. I think and there's now, actually maybe even yeah. 12. Allie would know the answer to that, probably. Now, isn't, isn't <laughs> well, this 25. the... Is, 25, <laughs> yeah, okay. See? So isn't this the line of, of HPV that famously Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones admitted they were dealing with that caused his, 
his throat cancer. Do you remember this a couple of years ago? I'm sure you're familiar with that case. Of, I mean, that, I only mentioned them because they went public with it. And he said he caught cancer. I mean, he said, not to be too graphic, but I think from oral sex with his wife who had HPV. I mean, I don't know that case, to be honest, Megan. I live under a rock a little bit, um, and certainly with Dr. Walsh as well, who I know I've known through the COVID pandemic, and uh, she's been a phenomenal pediatrician, and I'm very fortunate to share this time with her talking about this important issue. My children were vaccinated um, prior to COVID. I marched my kids into the immunization clinic, and we got our vaccines. I really did not think about vaccines other than rotavirus, and I did decline that one. But every other vaccine, we've marched right in and we've gotten them. We're a military family. When we go overseas and move, we have to get marched in and get Japanese encephalitis and other things. The way that the um, COVID vaccines were handled, the oversight, and specifically the way that the um, severe adverse event myocarditis was handled, actually a serious adverse event, really caused me to lose confidence in the FDA and the CDC and the ACIP, quite frankly, because they were pushing it for kids going to camp. Um, before we really had settled whether or not myocarditis was a serious signal. So my confidence was shaken. And following that time, I decided that it was important to actually really look into other vaccines and decided to look into the That's HPV on. vaccine, quite frankly, because it was the one that I had heard virologists and others talk about as being the most unassailable cancer preventing vaccine that we have, the very best that we have. So I decided to look into it and um, try to figure out whether or not, you know, I had full confidence in that vaccine. Okay. And so, so you, you try to take an honest, deep dive into, right. is this safe or isn't this safe? And, you know, you heard Kristen, Dr. Walsh say, you know, half adults could be more than that are carrying this thing and that the cancer burden is so high. That's why it's worth it. That's That's why I would say back in the city, my OBGYN, was like, you're definitely giving it to your daughter and you you should give it to your boys too. And she gave it to her daughter. She was practicing what she preached, you know, saying as, as in, you know, Kristen's a, a pediatrician, but my OBGYN is of course in women's reproductive health. And she was saying, you, you don't know how devastating it is when cervical cancer happens to somebody. And it potentially could have been avoided with this shot, you know, or a double shot, or if you, depending on how late in life you get it, it's a triple shot. But that's her point. She was coming in from the dealing with the women once they have the cancer point. Um, so why isn't that just ball game right there? Yes, it it can prevent cancer. Done. I'm getting it. Right. And it should have been. And that's the, the notion I brought into actually even looking into this vaccine in the first place, because who wouldn't want to prevent cancer? Um, but then the more I started digging, I've spent over 100 hours on this, and I've really only scratched the surface, I believe, um, in beginning to understand my clear position on this. But I came away asking more questions um, than I felt were answered. For instance, um, as Dr. Walsh alluded to, 90% of all of these infections are handled by the immune system within a year or two. So you build actually natural immunity, um, which is another lost story that we saw happen with the uh, pandemic as well. We neglected to discuss the importance of natural immunity. And quite frankly, I'm a huge fan of mucosal immunity. This is another virus that, you know, begins on the other side of the mucosa. And that's where the first battle is fought is at the mucosal layer of the Let me just clarify. And let me clarify that. And then I'll give you back the floor. So what you're saying is you may catch HPV and never know as as Kristen was saying, you may never know. You have it. You had intercourse, you have it. But your body is resolving it without you knowing anything. So you are so you have natural immunity to a lot of these strains without even knowing it. Just the same way we a lot of us did with COVID. Some of us had COVID and didn't even have any symptoms and wouldn't have even know when, known we had COVID if it weren't for the constant testing and therefore we had natural immunity. You're saying same thing here. Same thing here. Yeah. I mean your cervix you know, I'm sure most people have been through health ed in school and they know what the cervix is and where it is. And so it's outward facing at the top of the vagina. And so when you do have um, sex, I mean, you actually are exposing the cervix and the vagina to uh, organisms, including the HPV virus. And so that's where the first battle is actually fought. Oh, sweet. We do have that picture. We have a, we have so a medical the, picture of a cervix. Very nice. I asked for that. 
Um, so it's just really important to think about the mucosal layer, which is, you know, our airways lining our nose all the way down, you know, through our gut, um, which quite frankly constitutes most of your immune system in your gut. And that's why it matters what you eat. Um, but also in the vagina as well. Um, you can hear I have a cold. I'm recovering from a cold. That battle is being waged in my upper airways before it gets to my lungs. Same thing is true here with HPV. That battle is being waged in the epithelium of the cervix. And yes, some of these um, really bad strains do find a way to wedge themselves between the cells and get down to the basal layer, where they do get into the cells at the basal layer of the epithelium, and they start to cause mutations. And that can cause the, the warts that you might see rise up to the surface, right? If you have warts on your hand or somewhere else, you can actually see them. Hard to see on the cervix unless you go and get screened, which gets to my next point. The first point, point one was 90% resolve on their own. Point two is getting the vaccine actually doesn't remove the importance of getting routine pap screenings. Um, so that's something I wasn't frankly aware of either. We this still need big. to ask women to go in for screenings every three years. And so if we are giving them like essentially false hope that, you know, boom, you're done. This is a home run. You're not going to get cancer. We're actually giving them some misleading information that they do need to keep going in and get screenings. And the women, unfortunately, who are getting cervical cancer and dying of cervical cancer are the same women who face structural barriers to care that put them at higher risk for either not getting screened or not being able to follow up on important treatments for abnormal screens. Like many people, I am trying to eat healthier these days, and that's why I love good olive oil. When I've been making my salad dressings, I've been doing that. That's the one thing I'll do. I, I can cook that. <laughs> I have found that the difference between the olive oil, like if you use an old one, an unfresh one, you can taste it big time. This matters. Good in the field of olive oil means fresh, okay? Olive oil packs the most flavor and healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. But that's the problem with the supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on that shelf for many, many months. You have no idea how long growing stale. This is why I like my olive oil direct from small award-winning farms, thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I tasted TJ's Farm Fresh oils, I fell in love with their vibrant, grassy flavors. They're delicious on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. As an introduction to his Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club, TJ's willing to send you a full-size $39 bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just $1 to help him cover shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just $1 in shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to HarvestFreshNow.com, HarvestFreshNow.com for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping, HarvestFreshNow.com. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.